God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours in Jesus Christ. Amen. Call me a curmudgeon, but here's what I don't like about gift giving nowadays. All of the thoughtfulness and surprise has been taken out of it by the Christmas list. It used to be that you needed to know something about the person you were going to get a gift for so that you could select a gift that they would both appreciate and enjoy receiving. Something that would perhaps even surprise them. Not so anymore. Now you look at their list, select an item that fits your budget, and buy it. All of the thoughtfulness is gone. And I won't ask for a show of hands, but I wonder how many of the teenagers who are here this morning actually texted their Christmas list to their parents, complete with links to each item on Amazon, so that all mom or dad would have to do is click the link once to see the item, a second time to order it, and perhaps a third time to have Amazon do the gift wrapping for them. Right? Christmas lists have taken all of the thoughtfulness out of gift giving, as well as the surprise, what's left for gift opening, but finding out which or how many of the items on your list are residing under the tree in brightly wrapped paper. I think Christmas lists do one more thing, and that's that they set us up for disappointment. You could ask the children who are here how you would feel if what you get for Christmas isn't what you wanted. You ask your parents for some new art supplies or a new Star Wars Lego set, or maybe just one uninterrupted evening in which to play Smash Brothers all night. But when it comes time for gift opening, you tear the paper off and there is a sweater. (laughs) Disappointment reigns. In fact, I can think of only one way in which you wouldn't be disappointed if you don't get something off your list, and that's if the person who's getting you a gift knows you so well that they got you something even better than what you put on your list. You only asked for the X-Wing Lego set for $79.99, but they sprung for the Millennium Falcon, $799.99 worth of Legos. Then you won't be disappointed at all. Think about the wish lists in the hearts of the two women we meet today as they meet, Mary and Elizabeth. It's not too hard for us to imagine what each of those women wanted. And they present a striking contrast, not only in what they wanted, but in what they received from God. Start with Elizabeth. Elizabeth had had one thing on her wish list forever. For all her entire adult life, there was just one thing Elizabeth wanted, And year after year after year, Elizabeth was consistently disappointed. She didn't get what she received. Until Elizabeth had, in all likelihood, stopped asking. It just wasn't going to happen. That time had passed. And only then did God give her exactly what she wanted. Her heart's desire, the one item, the one thing on her wish list, And it was right at this moment when Mary stepped over the threshold of her home that Elizabeth felt that welcome kick, welcome discomfort, the reminder that her dream was coming true and and so soon she would hold her very own baby in her arms. God giving Elizabeth exactly what she wanted. But then there's Mary. Mary had in her mind's eye a lovely wedding and the start to a happily married life. But God was not going to give Mary what she had in mind. And we don't know exactly how the timeline worked out or what Joseph did or didn't know at this point, but given what we do know, we might expect to find Mary on Elizabeth's doorstep in tears pregnant and hormonal by no choice of her own. And and how in all the world was she supposed to convince Joseph to believe her story? It may be that at this very moment, Joseph was busy filling out the divorce papers. 
And perhaps the angel pointed Mary to Elizabeth, and Mary went to Elizabeth's house because of all of the people in her life, no one but Elizabeth or Zechariah stood a chance of possibly believing Mary. If Mary had on her wish list a wedding dress, she got maternity clothing instead. Not at all what she planned, desired, or wanted. Funny, the way that God works. It seems to me that sometimes our prayer lives are like our Christmas lists. We send them to God. We text them to his throne via prayer, complete with links to be clicked and ordered because we know exactly what we would like. And we tell it all to God and, and then we really hope that he won't disappoint us, but that he will give us exactly what we're hoping for. But more often than not, God gives us something that wasn't on our list. Or the way he gives it to us is different from the way that we think would have been better or best. And as often as not, we're disappointed. Like a little kid who asked for a Swiss Army knife and gets socks instead. God does something that we didn't want, desire, or expect. And we're saddened. How many times throughout all of those long years do you suppose that Zechariah and Elizabeth looked at each other and in disappointment said, it must be the Lord's will. How many times have you said something similar? seems like we only talk about the will of God when things go wrong in our lives. You lose your job unexpectedly and it makes you throw your hands up in the air and say, well, it must be the Lord's will. Or you, like Zechariah and Elizabeth, were desperately hoping to have a child of your own. But it must be God's will that I won't have that joy. A family member is diagnosed with cancer. Well, so it is. This is God's will. As if when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we get to the petition that says, your will be done, what we really mean is time for me to resign myself to the fact that life isn't going to turn out as I'd like it to. Friends, if that is so, then we have a lot to learn from that remarkable group of four standing on Elizabeth's doorstep. For whether they got what they wanted or didn't, there we find nothing but joy and wonder. Even Elizabeth, who finally was going to get a baby of her own, even Elizabeth cries out and exclaims in joy, not for herself, but for what God was going to accomplish through Mary. Do you see what she says? Yes, blessed are you, Mary. God has chosen you to be the mother of our Lord. Blessed is the baby in your womb who would cause this baby in mine to leap for joy. And then she says this, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. What did Elizabeth know that you and I have missed? Perhaps Elizabeth understood wish lists better than we gave her credit for. Because Elizabeth knew and understood this, we can present all the requests we want to God We can make our wishes known to him, but we had better do so knowing without a doubt that God knows us better than we know ourselves and that he gives gifts that never disappoint. In fact, we might even say that with God it works in reverse. God makes the list. He tells us exactly what he's going to give us And then he delivers, without fail, every single time. Think again about what Elizabeth said 
Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. You see, what made Elizabeth exclaim for joy and what made Mary sing, not cry, but sing for joy, is that they weren't focused so much on the circumstances of their lives and what they would want, what they hoped for or desired. No, they were focused instead on what God had spoken and promised. What kept Mary from resigning herself to the fact that her plans were altered was what God had sent the angel to announce. His own promise to her. His wish list, his will, his plan. And because she believed, and it is remarkable that she believed, Elizabeth was right. Mary was truly blessed. Blessed, you know, is a word that reminds us that everything we have we receive from God. It's all good gifts from his hand. And Elizabeth nailed it when she said, Mary believed, and so it is hers. See the lesson for us? Whether God gives us what we want or not, isn't so important. What is, is for us to look at his wish list for us. We call it his word, or or more specifically, we call it the gospel. That is, every promise that God has made to us in Jesus Christ, that little baby, as yet in Mary's womb, already now causing John to leap for joy, and Mary to sing, and Elizabeth to exclaim. Every single promise, and and the gifts that God has promised to us are not gifts that disappoint. In fact, they are gifts so great that we would never have dared to ask for them ourselves. Think about it. The gift of a Savior, would we really have asked God for that? You know when you're sitting at the dinner table and you accidentally knock your glass over and, and it spills everywhere? You don't expect someone else to clean the mess up for you. You know that it's your responsibility, so you get up from the table, you get the paper towel, and you start cleaning the spill up. When it comes to the really big mess, when it comes to our sins, isn't that the way that we would be inclined to think about it? This is my mess, I'd like to clean it up, and if we're going to ask God for anything, we're going to ask him what we need to do to make this mess go away. Tell me, God, what must I do? What vows do I need to make? How can I try harder in the future? What good can I do? What penance can I, can I do to make up for what I've done? But God gives us something better, something greater. He gives us a Savior because he knows we couldn't clean that mess up on our own. And Jesus comes and before we would even think of getting up from the table, he's already cleaned the entire mess up. And that's really just the start, isn't it? Who of us would have dared to ask God not only for a Savior, but that that Savior would be his one and only Son? And who of us would possibly have had the guts to ask God to curse his Son so that we would be blessed? But that is exactly what God promised. And as God spoke, so it was, and so it is. He sent the angel and he said, This Savior, his name is Jesus, to save his people from their sins. And he is the Son of the Most High. Son of the Most High. Cursed so that you and I would be forgiven. Believe it, and it's yours. Forgiveness, pure and clean. That's the blessing of belief. And it works the same way with every promise God makes to us, and there are so many. We could go on and on. 
if you feel like you really stink at life, like no one would want to be around you, or like no one cares. You have his own promise. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Believe it, and it's yours. It will be fulfilled just as he has said. And God's love is all yours. If you are afraid, racked with fear about your death, and what is going to happen to my family and what's going to happen to me, you have the words spoken by the Lord himself. I am the resurrection and the life. The life. Believe it, and it's yours. Whoever believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. That's the blessing of belief. The blessing of belief that Elizabeth put her finger on and that filled those saints of old with such joy at the advent of their Savior. Do you believe that this is so? That everything that God has promised, he will fulfill. If you don't, all you need to do is come to the Christmas services the next two days and see how God carried it out exactly as he said. And how our Savior was born. Because that's the way that gift-giving works with God. He makes the list. He tells us what he's going to do. And then he delivers every single time without fail. And for we who believe it, we are truly blessed. Because when that's the case, we always get exactly what we're hoping for. Amen. Please.